Thank you. Dr. Vomik. I want to thank Professor Srikantan and uh, Sangeeta Menon for this invitation to this exciting conference. <coughs> After the last speaker's talk, I feel ashamed to give a talk where I will be covering only a little bit. As Eugene Wigner was fond of saying, that his intention was not to cover everything, but to uncover a little, and this is what I will try to do. The title of my talk is, is Brain in a Current State. For those who are not physicists in this audience, a little uh, clarification of the word coherent state is in order. Uh, I think if you take a group of particles, whether these are atoms or electrons or light particles, let's say photons, you can prepare them in such a state that all the particles share a kind of a common destiny. They have a common equation of movement. They are in phase. And when they are in phase, uh, they can move without loss of energy. They are entangled over long distances. And this is a purely quantum phenomena, although this could manifest itself on a very macroscopic scale. Uh, there is no, no common day-to-day -day experience that we, I can describe it, but something like laser would be a good starting off point where you pump energy into a huge number of photons and let them fall at the same time to the ground state, and the resultant excitation, the lasing excitation, is extremely coherent. Uh, and the reason of this coherence is this phase coherence, and it turns out the number of particles and phase are complementary quantities. If you want to fix the phase, you have to vary the number of particles in a certain space. If you fix the number of particles, phase would become indefinite. So the idea is to have an open system where the number of particles, quantum or classical, it's for you to define, could vary at will. And if you can do that at will, you'll be able to lock the phase in to a common value, and you'll get a phase coherent state. I often think of human brain as one where this is actually happening on a practically macroscopic scale. I'm not thinking of the neuronal processes, which are a lot of ionic charges moving through in and out of the system, slashing seawater, if you like. And it's very hard, very difficult to accept the idea of phase coherence in this kind of a chaotic movement. And yet the order would come out of this chaos because at some stage, we don't know where in the neuronic processes, out of the, these electrical signals, which are all alike, to the, all the different cognition channels, suddenly, a sense of pain or fear or joy comes out, suddenly the whole process becomes mental. And what I will focus today on in this mental aspect, this mental space that brain seems to inhabit. And I'm trying for the last few years to try a, to find a simple language which will be acceptable to us physicists, scientists, as well as to people who are more conversant to the mentation phenomena as something spiritual, as something not definable, as something beyond the scale of physical senses. Uh, to do that, I thought of uh, starting a small neurological digression. Let me see. Is it? Okay. I thought I would do a small neurological digression, but my time would not permit to do so. In any way, I know less of neurology than most of you present here, so I wouldn't upset anybody's uh, uh, thinking on the subject. Uh, let me simply make this following point. I am thinking, and I'll be continually thinking through this talk and through the work I'm doing, of the phenomena of mentations as being consist 
as consisting of the so-called mental particles, like thought particles. And why do I use the word particles? Uh, because particles are excitation, they are the same in the physical universe that we inhabit. Uh, they carry, uh, by definition, energy and momentum. And if they do so, then we can use it. We can use it, and I'd like to show you just uh, one video. I don't know if it's going to come through or not. Oh. Okay, uh, this I would pass by. Okay, this, before this video, I want to uh, show you this uh, EG signals. Uh, what we have on the top figure is a subject to whom visual stimulus is given, which is picked up on the uh, left and right occipital region of the brain, where the visual signals come, and you can see the little beeps there. And the same subject is used to deep meditation. And as you can see in the lower figures, the visual signals have disappeared, but the subject is perfectly awake to the universe, is perfectly aware that the universe around him. So somehow, this is a work that done in a Paris uh, neurological laboratory has been repeated in, uh, at Minnesota. It's simply showing to you that the neuronal and the mental can be separated in certain uh, brain state. Um, the video that I will show you is due to, due to Professor Nicolaitis. It's a very famous experiment. It came out the front page of the New York Times in 2006. It shows uh, the monkey Aurora, who is controlling, first of all, with his muscular signals, which are taken from his brain. This handle he's moving with his hand, which will re be repeated when the muscular, muscular neuronal signal will fade to the robotic arm. And this, of course, Nikolai D. says that Aurora had been doing for five years. Then one day he did something very different. And this, would it start? Okay, thank you. Gosh. I hope the sound is loud enough for you to see. Other scientists are attempting to interface technology with a mind that is far closer to our own. This is meant going beyond what for many are the acceptable limits of science. Recording from conscious, highly intelligent beings. The brain was considered the last frontier, really the impenetrable part of us. And we are just learning that we can actually go in there and read thoughts. For Professor Miguel Nicolelis, the key to the human mind lies in studying some of our closest relatives. By implanting electrodes into the brains of monkeys, Nicolaelis is able to eavesdrop on their thoughts. We have been recording this every day for the last five years. So we have listened to this brain for the last five years. And every day we learn something new about how it is that he operates. Here you see one brain cell firing every time the animal wants to move its arm. And here you have a collection of hundreds of these cells. It's a sweeping flow of electricity across the entire brain. And I should see the building up of the code. It's a hidden code. We don't have a Rosetta Stone. We don't know where to start. We don't know what the symbols mean. In a groundbreaking but controversial experiment, Nicolela set out to make sense of this secret language. First, he trained a monkey to play a computer game, using a cursor to meet a moving target. As the monkey controlled the joystick, Nicolaelis recorded the activity of the hundreds of brain cells involved in making these complex movements. He then translated these biological recordings into the language of a computer. This now allowed him to perform an extraordinary feat. 
he connected the monkey's brain to a computer that drove a robotic arm. The computer read the monkey's thoughts and made the robotic arm move in exactly the same way as the monkey's. Nikolaelis was using the thoughts of another being to control a machine. He had shown that the seemingly opaque language of the brain could be read. It's all here. And this is not only in a primate brain, it's in our own brain. The day we discover how our brain works is going to be by understanding sounds like this and images like this. This is the essential alphabet of the mind. All memories, all our thinking of the future, our expectations, our love, our sorrows, is all embedded in these patterns. One event in Professor Miguel Nicolelis's research has revealed just how far reaching its effect could be. Well, I like to call that the turning point moment of my life. And that moment probably will never be equal to anything we'll do in the rest of our careers because there was an instant where a complete new field opened up. Nicolaelis had connected the brain of a monkey to a computer. As the monkey moved a cursor, Nicolaelis used the data from its brain to move a robot arm. In doing so, he had shown how the monkey's thoughts could be read. But the monkey was about to turn the tables on Nicolaelis. All of a sudden, our uh, monkey, Aurora, stopped moving her arm. And when we saw that, there was a profound silence in the room because we knew that history had been made right at that moment. The monkey realized that it didn't have to move its arm to play the game. It could now control the robotic arm by thought alone. The brain finally was freed from the body and could now act upon the world directly, directly, just by producing what it produces every second, electrical activity that could now be harnessed to generate motion. So it need them, the brain did not need the body anymore. Nicolaelis had shown how technology could enhance the capabilities of humans. Well, this experiment profound me, profoundly moved me. I thought of the Michelson-Morley experiment, which gave us the absolute velocity of light earlier part of the 20th century. I do not know how you will interpret this experiment. I think each one will have a different opinion. As a simple physicist, I thought that the first time in my life, although one suspected it, it showed without any doubt that the mental excitations carry energy and momentum and can be treated as such if we find a language in which to transfer it to the problem of the brain and consciousness. Now, these excitations or particles, I will use the word interchangeably, are the quantum of the classical. Now, if they were, if these particles are classical, let's say I'm plotting here x as a function of time, t, and they would go from a point A to A prime, and if they are classical particles, they will follow a path. It's called the path of least action, or rapidest time, and there's a thick line that I have drawn there. But then, given the initial condition at the point A, it will always follow that line, and if thought particle or mental excitations follow that, there is virtually no free will possible for the, it will always be programmed to do the same thing again and again and again. But we know that it doesn't do that. We know that between A and A prime, it can wander around all over the brain, gathering more information, um, gathering more quantum of information. And we do not know at any point X prime, or at any point T prime, what X prime it's going to be at. And so the 
probability amplitude of this particle going from A to A prime is a sum of all these paths. It's called Feynman action paths. Each path weighted by the, the action, which will be, have to be divided by H bar. H bar is the quantum Planck's constant to give you the quantum of action in each of these paths. And only when you sum it up, you'll be able to say the probability of arriving at A prime starting from A is this. And I suspect that these particles, these excitations are quantum in nature, and we really have to go from this classical thick line description to a more quantum language to be in touch with the reality of our thought processes. To do that, let me introduce a general Hilbert space in which the mentation would occur. And this would take us from classical to quantum mechanics, and that would help us to go into the things we are talking about. We started with Euclid, who gave us the space as we know, as we live every day, X, Y, Z, whose Fourier component is, is K. And this went on for many years until, until Minkowski came, and he gave us time dimension that Einstein used to have the classical theory of relativity. <coughs> so dimension from three became four. In the 20s, quantum mechanics was being developed by particularly Du Bois and uh, Schrodinger. The Schrodinger wave equations came into being. At this time, a young prodigious Hungarian, von Neumann, who was working with Hilbert, who was the greatest mathematician of the time at Göttingen. And von Neumann immediately saw that the idea of Hilbert space, which is an, ab which is an abstract space, compared to the so-called physical space, could be a wonderful theater to describe quantum mechanics. And what Hilbert did, and what actually von Neumann did, he did three things to put quantum mechanics on a firm mathematical, physical ground. He first said, let us do away with the wave functions. Instead, let us think of an abstract space, a mental space, where we have complex vectors instead of those real vectors. And these complex vectors, Dirac called them Ked vectors, just, just a symbol. And von Neumann said, we take orthogonal complex vectors to describe the whole space so that any arbitrary vector can be written as a sum of this complex Hermitian machine, which will give us an Hermitian task that we want the machine to do. So this space, von Neumann called it Hermitian physical Hilbert space. And this space is full of real numbers. And at this stage, von Neumann introduced a second concept, which is very useful. He introduced operators. And these operators, they are neither gods nor demons. Their function is to do something in this space. For example, if I have, to give you an Hartman operator would be, if I have a bath of water whose temperature I want to measure, I take a thermometer, which is my operator, if you like. I dip the thermometer into the water, and it gives me a temperature. And this temperature is a real number. So your thermometer is an operator. Your bath water is this vector, abstract vector, if you like. Only condition you ask for the operator that when he makes the temperature <coughs> measurement, the temperature of the bath water doesn't change. It doesn't have to be a huge thermometer, if you like. So this was the second uh, thing that von Neumann introduced, the concept of operator, which has become the basis of quantum mechanics ever since. And operators come in all different forms and shapes. There are operators to measure temperature, as I mentioned, operators to measure velocity, momentum operators to measure the length of space. There are Hamiltonian operators, which measures the energy, which is again a real number in Hermitian Hilbert space. And by energy being real, it means in this space, in time you can go forward and backward. There is no irreversibility of time. 
And there you say, ho, ho, this is not going to help me because I leave my brain lives in a world which is irreversible. I have a sense of time passing from past through present through future. So we have to do something to this transmission universe space. We have to extend it. And this is what I have done. What I have done, and let me tell you at the beginning, very beginning, that in the panoply of the operators that we have in quantum mechanics, I introduced a new operator. I called it self-operator. Self-operator, I call it S. Why is it an operator? Because what I want the self-operator to do is to the, use the brain as a mental space where the self-operator will create information. Can I have a glass of water? My self-operator will create information because the brain is an information space. I don't want to use the word qubit because I'll show you in a second. This qubit is a non-starter in the, in the whole game. And it is an invention of the IBM group to make bigger and bigger, more and more complex computers, faster and more and more parallel, to, onto which the artificial intelligence people have latched onto, pretending that if you make computers denser and denser, suddenly, lo and behold, consciousness would flash out of it like sun coming out of a fog. I think this would never happen. I think it never, never happen because an orthogonal Hilbert, Hilbertian space cannot capture even the elemental mental process. What we have to do, we have to make this space expanded and I want to introduce a general Hilbert space, which I call a tale of two cities, in which I have two inner space built into it. One is a space A, which I will call very verifiable representations. Essentially, these are objective space, fact space. You might think they're almost Hilbertian in its basic nature. Oh my gosh. And the second space is not so verifiable representations. And this is the meaning space, interpretation space. And the second space between these two, the Hilbert space, is HA, tensile product of HB, and this is a mental Hilbert space. I'm told that time is really almost gone. What's happening? I'm sorry. This is, uh, I want to go forward and it's not going forward. Okay, go forward. Okay. Okay, I am to, I'm going to sk skip that. In non Hermitian Hilbert space, I have almost the same structure, but Kate and Brown are the same because now to every physical fact, I want to attach an emotional interpretation, a feeling space, which is the dual space, which is every psi attach a phi. And I need a symmetry operation to go from one space to another. I'm going to squeeze all that. And this is where Wigner comes in, because this operation has to be antilinear, anti-unitary, and invertible. I should be able to go from one space to the other and come back from Filling space is a fact space, which the neurons would do for me. And what happens in these two spaces, they live in two different complex energy spaces because it's non hermitian And in every new neuron, the two spaces can get mixed up because the parameter lambda, and this is an exceptional point topologically, where the fact is going to be fusion with fiction, if you like, to become the fabric of a daily reality. This really captures, in a very elementary level, what goes on brain. This shows you why we need biorthogonal. For a full stomach, you need to associate satiety with it. For an empty stomach, you need to have a hunger. And when you want to describe a general state of a stomach, if you like, you need both spaces. And how does the brain mix up its mind? Here is a coherent state finally it has formed out of 
psi alpha, alpha the cognition channels. In a brain, you have many cognition channels, and each, each cognition channels, you have information content N, and you add it up in a phase coherent way, you get in a cognition channel a coherent, a coherent cognition possibility. And this is written by the operator, self-operator, which is operating on the vacuum state, which is zero, will give you this coherent state. Let me just wait one second on this vacuum state. It may be very close to what Professor Vomik will tell you about quantum vacuum, but this vacuum state is really what you need to have a coherent, meaningful information. Why? When you are, when you are listening to me, between my word and a word, there's a space where there's no word. This is the vacuum state. When you listen to music, which is note and note, there's some silence. And if there's no silence, there is no music. That silence is the vacuum state. And the coherent state is such that it carries that zero with it all along, so that the information will be meaningful. And this gives you the mathematical definition of coherent state and genetic identity. And as a result of the self-operator, I create an order parameter in every cognition channel. This is straightforward physics. There's no trickery in it. And this average of this S operator is the cognition order parameter of the system. And let me tell you what it does. If you look at this famous painting of Gauguin, it asks this question not only where you come from or where you are going, but what are we? I don't know what are we, but I try to answer what am I? And what am I is really a matrix. And this matrix is a diagonal matrix of every single cognition channel we have. Very simple mathematics, nothing wrong with it, including the memory state and the unconscious state. So I have a matrix, and there I took a major step and I called it I, which is a trace of this matrix. And whenever this I can form, that is the coherence is established during in every cognition channel, the sum total of this complex vector is non-zero. I have created an I, which is a trace, and we get trace, it's space and time independent. So this I that, that I have, it doesn't live in space, doesn't live in time. It's uniform throughout the whole, whole brain, and it's uniform through time. So when I go to sleep, I doesn't go to sleep. When I wake up, I wake up with this I. This I is with me till I die. Perhaps it doesn't die with, with my death. This is pure speculation. Okay, my time, I think, as the Vomik is saying, I would not be able to tell you about conscious or unconscious response. These response functions in first order, first order linear response theory to the external world, it comes out very automatically. And you have conscious perception, which is the lossy part of this response function. The unconscious perception is the real part of this response function. So unconscious and conscious perception are automatically built in into this self-operator or fluctuation for the self-operator. And these are the two responses. And I think Professor Vomik wants me to stop. So I give you the two conclusions that I need a non hermitian Hilbert space to reconcile mind-matter duality, that information vectors and different cognition channels will constitute the current state of brain, whose signature is I, that we have for a normal healthy brain. And that's the quantum average of this operator. I was not able to tell you about this cognitive response function, which is really very beautiful and simple-minded way but not that simple, but it's still unconscious. I want to say dissipative part of this cognitive susceptibility. Finally, I will tell about this operator, what Sakurai said about the photon operators. And you can read it for yourself. Actually, this S operator, I had, did not have time to tell you. They come in three forms, as Sakurai mentioned. And there really is the basis of our Indian philosophy. So somehow, in my beginning is my end, if you like. And these are some of the people that have helped. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Professor Chakraborty, for a wonderful, fascinating talk. We we'll probably need another conference to go into all the details, and hopefully, probably next time we'll do that. But I think we have a few minutes to have one or two questions. Uh, anybody? Uh, Dr. Alex Hankey from Svyasa Swami Vivekananda Yogana Sandana Sanstana. I trained in physics under Stephen Weinberg. Um, it's very interesting to see you postulate a different kind of space for subjective experience. But is there anything in your hypothesis which gives it a process of self-referral? Any sense of self-observation, any sense of self-knowledge in, intrinsic in your construction. Yes, yes, there, there is. In fact, what I didn't have time to show you, that when you develop the idea of conscious response as perturbation of the ground state, which is the I, to external world, this susceptibility has two parts built into it. One is I, dagger I, susceptibility, which is a self-awareness part of it which is really, doesn't really depend on the world in itself, which is the self-referral that you mentioned. And the other is psi dagger psi, psi, psi being the fluctuation operator from this ground state, and that is precisely the consciousness of the external world. So both of these parts are integral with the response function, which I'll call consciousness. One is self-consciousness, and the other is world consciousness. They're neatly separated at that level of Approximation. You've named you've named two conditions, which were hypothesized by Professor Lawrence Domash in 1972. One is the relationship between the creation and destruction operators in quantum theory, and the creation and destruction properties of the uh, of the Hindu uh, uh, trilogy. Um, uh, Trinity. Trinity. Yes. Um, and then. This idea that uh, you have that self-referral process going on was also contained in that work as well. But it can actually be uh, established within the structure of biological systems by using the concept of criticality from complexity biology, and that may be something we should discuss. Because criticality uses something which is intrinsically a self-observing system, because it's, point, it's the point where the feedback loops become self-sustaining. It's the edge of chaos. It's um, now called criticality, and it's been verified for a very wide range of biological systems. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have, I can discuss this with you another time. Neeraj Upadhyay from Center for Converging Technologies. I have one question, sir. What happened when the degenerate state lies in how the self operate on degenerate state in the non-verifiable condition? And like emotion and meaning condition, how it operate on the how self operate on the degenerate mental well, states. Well, this size you have, I skipped through this slide, and this self operator, it has a spectral decomposition. The spectral decomposition is one side the feeling state, other side the factual state. The bra and the ket, yes. they're not the same. And S and S jaga, simply you do a Hermitian conjugation. So the degenerate states that you mentioned actually have to be built in. In other words, self-operator, the way I define is so beautiful that it cannot operate only on fact space or on feeling space. It needs both. So the spectral decomposition actually, this was one slide I just went through because I had no time left. You know, I, I, is that, does that answer the question you're asking me? Anil Seth from University of Sussex, thanks for, for a great talk. I have, I guess, a question that would equally apply to, to you and to Stuart Hamroff before, which is, however beautiful the theory is, and very beautiful theory, scientific theories always stand or fall on making testable predictions. And now that we have available all sorts of ways of manipulating experience you know, in psychophysics using binocular rivalry so we can be conscious or not conscious of physical stimuli in the environment. We can also manipulate conscious level by anesthesia and sleep and so on. What specific predictions can you draw from any of these quantum mechanical approaches that can be testable using the kinds of experiments that we can now do? Yeah, very, I think it's a very good question. I cannot answer for Hammeroff and, uh, no. and Penrose. 
what I have really tried to do uh, is extremely simple. If I accept the presence of self-operator, and let me just point this to you, that uh, the idea of self, of course, is deep in Indian philosophy. Going back, mine is, is a bastardized version of that. But I had a friend at Paris, uh, a Chilean biologist, who have shown, uh, is gone now, that self actually in human body, there is a cognitive self, there is an immunological self, and each time the objective of the self is to affirm the genetic identity, the uniqueness of the individual. And what I've shown you, that when this S operator can have a macroscopic average, the I, the uniqueness of me, and not I'm not talking of uh, talking of uh, glory or anything like this, that each one of us is unique, whether we like it or not, and this can be affirmed. But this I is not just conscious self. It is all, actually, it is, I would say, it's kind of a platonic self average, this I, total I. And predictability is this, that this I would exist even when conscious I is not there anymore. And this is the case when you're unconscious, you can wake up, it's a symmetry broken state. So when you wake up, you retrieve the same eye. You must do that. Otherwise, you are actually gone, you know. So that this is the predictability that if this, this macroscopic average does exist, since it's a trace operator, independent of space and time, I must retrieve it all the time. So you may put yourself to sleep, you will still find it back when you come out, happily so. And the other predictability is that I have the free energy curve that I couldn't show you, whose minimum is this I. The slope of that minimum is the world, and that slope is zero. So whenever this I occurs, the world, external world, must go to zero. So this is another predictability. So they are kind of self-consistent. Now with these new uh, sets of imagery techniques, I really do not know exactly in which direction one has to go, but I would think that like that experiment that Benjamin Libe did, that is you can try to find out exactly when the conscious perception ap appeared corresponding to unconscious perception. But can one do that on healthy individuals? Can one do that on live brains? I do not know, I would like to have some opinion. But I think some of these would be doable in the future. I think we have a couple of minutes to have one or last questions, but if you have any other questions, Professor Chakraborty would be here, and I would request you to uh, submit the questions to him uh, for discussions later on. And uh, so I will have the last question. Okay, uh, you see, I'm uh, Subdev from the Albag Education Institute in Agra. Just wanted to ask you, how do you correlate your self-operator and the theory with the quantum measurement problem? Does it help in resolving that? Uh, well, I don't really have a quantum measurement problem because the beauty of a coherent state mm. that it's the class is the quantum limit of a classical state or classical limit of a quantum state. So the measurements that a operator will have to do are almost classical in nature. Right. Of course, they are entangled because feeling and fact are entangled. Though the two parts of the Hilbert space are entangled through this S operator, but this is not a question of quantum measurement. In fact, I try to stay away from okay. that kind of questions. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, if, you'd, uh, uh, if you'd just give the questions and later on gets to answer, uh, because uh, uh, please ask the questions, but sure. I guess you have the answer. Uh, you know, the answer should be given later on. Sure, Mr. Murray. Uh, it's a very short question. I'm Sam from Pondicherry, uh, researcher in Shirobindunian evolutionary thought. Uh, it's a very interesting topic, looking within, and this question relates to Miguel Nicolás's experiment. If we take the analogy that a computer can control the action, and so monkey stops, if I've understood correctly, can we take this a little in a different uh, scale, 
that if there was a Gnostic computer or a Gnostic external server, would it be possible in the same line that it can control human action? I think we, we wanted to hear the questions, um, but uh, unfortunately there is no I'm time. Not, uh, I'm, we, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't answer that question very well. <laughs> Maybe I understand can, the question. Okay, but, uh, that's good enough. Sort of, I'm, I'm trying to research yes, into uh, that. Uh, yes, yeah. And I would like to be able to connect with you later. Okay, we can talk. Okay, but, uh, thank you. Doctor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Chakraborty. <clears throat>